Section 5, Caroline Products and the Various Levels of Equal Protection Scrutiny. Despite the undoubted importance of Brown, much of modern equal protection dur jurisprudence stems from the fourth footnote in United States v. Caroline Products Company, 1938, a Commerce Clause in Substantive Due Process case. In 1937, the court, in what was called the, quote, switch in time that saved nine, had loosened its rules for deciding whether Congress could regulate certain commercial activities. In discussing the new presumption of constitutionality that the court would apply to economic legislation, Justice Harlan Stone wrote, Prejudice against discrete and insular minorities may be a special condition which tends seriously to curtail the operation of those political processes ordinarily to be relied upon to protect minorities, and which may call for a correspondingly more searching judicial inquiry. Thus were born the, quote, more searching levels of scrutiny strict and intermediate, with which the court would examine legislation directed at racial minorities and women. Although the court first articulated a, quote, strict scrutiny standard for laws based on race-based distinctions in Harabjai v. United States, 1943, and Korematsu v. United States, 1944, it should be noted that the court did not apply strict scrutiny by that name until the 1967 case of a majority of, of the loving court v. Virginia until the 1970s and that intermediate scrutiny of Craig did not Warren. command the the Supreme Court has defined these levels of scrutiny in the following way: one, strict scrutiny if the law categorizes on the basis of race, the law is unconstitutional unless it is narrowly tailored to serve a compelling government interest. 2. Intermediate scrutiny, if the law categorizes on the basis of sex. The law is unconstitutional unless it is substantially related to an important government interest. Note that the past decisions, sex generally has meant gender. 3. Rational basis test, if the law categorizes on some other basis. The law is constitutional so long as it is reasonably related to a legitimate government interest. There is, arguably, a fourth level of scrutiny for equal protection cases. In United States v. Virginia, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg issued the language of intermediate scrutiny for sex-based discrimination and instead demanded that litigants demonstrate an, quote, exceedingly persuasive argument to justify gender discrimination. Whether this was simply a rearticulation of the doctrine of intermediate scrutiny, or whether it created a new level of scrutiny between the intermediate and strict standards, is unclear. Section 6. Discriminatory Intent or Disparate Impact Another controversial area of equal protection theory although it seems that the legal doctrine has been settled by the Supreme Court, is the issue of whether an equal protection violation requires purposeful discrimination, or whether it merely requires what is termed disparate impact. In other words, does the Equal Protection Clause outlaw public policies that cause racial disparities for example, a public school examination that more white students than black students pass? Or, on the other hand, does it merely outlaw 
intentional bigotry by public officials. The Supreme Court has answered. It depends. In the context of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which forbids job discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, sex, or religion, and applies both to private and to public employers, the Supreme Court has answered, in Griggs v. Duke Power Company, 1971, that, 1. If an employer's policy has disparate racial consequences, and 2. If the employer can't give a reasonable justification for such a policy on grounds of business necessity, then the employer's policy violates Title VII. In the years since Griggs, courts have defined business necessity as requiring the employer to prove that whatever is causing the racial disparity, be it a test, an educational requirement, a hiring practice, has a demonstrable factual relationship to making the company mortable. In most other situations, however, the court's focus is on discriminatory intent. This was made clear in the seminal case of Arlington Heights v. Metropolitan Housing Corp., 1977. In that case, the plaintiff, a housing developer, sued a Chicago suburb that had refused to rezone a plot of land in order to allow low-income, racially integrated housing to be built. There was no clear evidence of racially discriminatory intent on the part of the Arlington Heights Planning Commission. The result, however, was racially disparate, since the refusal prevented more African Americans and Hispanics than whites from moving in. Justice Lewis Powell, writing for the court, asked, quote, Proof of racially discriminatory intent or purpose is required to show a violation of this Equal Protection Clause. Disparate impact merely has an evidentiary value. Absent a stark pattern, said the court, impact is not determinative. See also Washington v. Davis, 1976. Defenders of the court's approach in Arlington Heights and Washington v. Davis, argue that the Equal Protection Clause was not intended to guarantee equal outcomes, but rather equal opportunities, and that, therefore, we shouldn't be concerned with trying to fix every racially disparate effect. We should worry only about intentional bigotry. Others point out that the courts are merely enforcing the Equal Protection Clause, and that if the legislature wants to correct racially disparate effects, it may do so through further legislation. Critics of the approach, however, contend that focusing on intent and according only an evidentiary value to disparate racial impact misses the point. Racial bigotry, they say, is especially nowadays, unconscious. Giving much more weight to disparate impact can remedy the kind of unconscious racism that a requirement of conscious discriminatory intent cannot. This debate, though, goes on almost entirely in the academy, since the Supreme Court has not changed its basic approach, as outlined in Arlington Heights. Section 7. Suspect Classes The Supreme Court has seemed unwilling to extend suspect class status, i.e., status deserving of greater judicial protection by means of higher levels of scrutiny, to groups other than women and racial minorities. In City of Selburn v. Selburn Living Center, Incorporated. 1985, 
the court refused to make the mentally retarded a suspect class. Many commentators have noted, however, and Justice Marshall so notes in his partial concurrence, that the court does appear to examine the city of Selburn's denial of a permit to a group home for mentally retarded people with a significantly higher degree of scrutiny than is typically associated with the rational basis test. In Lawrence v. Texas, 2003, the court struck down a Texas statute prohibiting homosexual sodomy on substantive due process grounds. In Justice Sandra Day O'Connor's opinion, concurring in the judgment, however, she argued that by prohibiting only homosexual sodomy, and not heterosexual sodomy as well, Texas's statute did not meet rational basis review under the Equal Protection Clause. Her opinion prominently cited City of Selburn. Notably, O'Connor did not claim to apply a higher level of scrutiny than mere rational basis, and as a larger matter, the court has not extended suspect class status to gays or lesbians. Much as in City of Selburn, though, the court's decision in Romer v. Evans, 1996, which O'Connor also relied on in her Lawrence opinion, and which struck down a Colorado constitutional amendment aimed at denying homosexuals minority status quota preferences, protected status, or a claim of discrimination, seemed to employ a markedly higher level of scrutiny than the nominally applied rational basis test. It seems probable, therefore, that the court, whatever it may decide about the constitutionality of laws that prohibit same-sex unions, will not explicitly apply heightened scrutiny to them. However, this question is unresolved. It has been argued that discrimination based on sex should be interpreted to include discrimination based on sexual orientation, in which case intermediate scrutiny could apply to gay civil rights cases. Section 8. Affirmative Action Affirmative action is the policy of consciously setting racial ethnic, religious, or other kinds of diversity as a goal within an organization, and, in order to meet that goal, purposefully selecting people from groups that have historically been oppressed or denied equal opportunities. In affirmative action, individuals of one or more of these minority backgrounds are preferred, ceteris parabolis over those who do not have such characteristics. Such a preferential system is sometimes effected through quotas, though this need not necessarily be so. Although there were forms of what is now called affirmative action during the Reconstruction, most of which were implemented by the same persons who framed the 14th Amendment, the modern history of affirmative action began with the Kennedy administration and started to flourish during the Johnson administration with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and two executive orders. These policies directed agencies of the federal government to employ a proportionate number of minorities whenever possible. Several important affirmative action cases to reach the Supreme Court have concerned government contractors. For instance, Adiran Constructors v. Pena, 1995, and City of Richmond v. J. A. Cronson Company, 1989. But the most famous cases have dealt with affirmative action as practiced by public universities. Regents of the University of California v. Bakke, 1978, and two companion cases decided by the Supreme Court in 2003, Gruder v. Bollinger and Gratz v. Bollinger. 
In Bakke, the court held that racial quotas are unconstitutional, but that educational institutions could legally use race as one of many factors to consider in their admissions process. In Gruder and Gratz, the court upheld both Bakke as a president and the admissions policy of the University of Michigan Law School. In dicta, however, Justice O'Connor, writing for the court, said she expected that in 25 years racial preferences would no longer be necessary. In Gratz, the court invalidated Michigan's undergraduate admissions policy on the grounds that unlike the law school's policy, which treated race not as one of many factors in the admissions process that looked to the individual applicant, the undergraduate policy used a point system that was excessively mechanistic. In these affirmative action cases, the Supreme Court has employed, or has said it employed, strict scrutiny, since the affirmative action policies challenged by the plaintiffs categorized by race. The policies in Bakke and Gruder passed because the court deemed that they were narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling interest in diversity. On one side, critics have argued that the scrutiny the court has applied is much less searching than true strict scrutiny, and that the court has acted not as a principled legal institution, but as a biased political one. On the other side, it is argued that the purpose of the Equal Protection Clause is to prevent the socio-political subordination of some groups by others, not to prevent classification. Since this is so, non-invidious classifications, such as those used by affirmative action programs, should not be subject to heightened scrutiny. Section 9. The Equal Protection Clause and Voting Although the Supreme Court ruled in Nixon v. Herndon, 1927, and Gamillion v. Lightfoot, 1960, that the Constitution prohibited denial of the vote based on race, those decisions were based on the 15th Amendment, the first significant application of the Equal Protection Clause to voting came in Baker v. Carr, 1962, where the court ruled that the districts that sent representatives to the Tennessee State Legislature were so malapportioned, with some legislators representing ten times the number of residents as others, that they violated the Equal Protection Clause. This ruling was extended two years later in Reynolds v. Sims, 1964, in which a one-man, one-vote standard was laid down. In both houses of state legislatures, each resident had to be given equal weight in representation. It may seem counterintuitive that the Equal Protection Clause should provide for equal voting rights. After all, it would seem to make the 15th Amendment and the 19th Amendment redundant. Indeed, it was on this argument, as well as on the legislative history of the 14th Amendment, that Justice John M. Harlan, the grandson of the earlier Justice Harlan, relied in his dissent from Reynolds. Harlan quoted the congressional debates of 1866 to show that the framers did not intend for the Equal Protection Clause to extend to voting rights, and in reference to the 15th and 19th Amendments, he said, If constitutional amendment was the only means by which all men, and later women, could be granted the right to vote at all, even for federal officers, how can it be that the far less obvious right to a particular kind of apportionment of state legislatures can be conferred 
by judicial construction of the Fourteenth Amendment. However, Reynolds and Baker did not lack a rationale, if seen in a broader perspective. The Supreme Court has repeatedly stated that voting is a fundamental right on the same plane as marriage, loving v. Virginia, privacy, Griswold v. Connecticut, 1965, or interstate travel, Shapiro v. Thompson, 1969. For any abridgment of those rights to be constitutional, the court has held, the legislation must pass strict scrutiny. Thus, on this account, equal protection jurisprudence may have been appropriately applied to voting rights. A recent use of equal protection doctrine came in Bush v. Gore, 2000. At issue was the controversial recount in Florida in the aftermath of the 2000 presidential election. There, the Supreme Court decided that the different standards of counting ballots across Florida violated the Equal Protection Clause. It was not this decision that proved especially controversial among commentators, and indeed, the proposition gained seven out of nine votes. Justices Souter and Breyer joined the majority of five. But only, it should be emphasized, for the finding that there was an equal protection violation. What was controversial was, first, the remedy upon which the majority agreed, that even though there was an equal protection violation, there was not enough time for a recount, and second, the suggestion that the equal protection violation was true only on the facts of Bush v. Gore. Commentators suggested that this meant that the court did not wish its decision to have any precedential effect, and that this was evidence of its unprincipled decision-making. The article suggests that you also consult Wikipedia articles on Animal Rights, Equal Consideration of Interests, Gay Rights, Human Rights, Majoritarianism, and Social Contract. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org slash copyleft slash fdl.html. It was created on 9 April 2006.